Kasia Valiska Mamon is the costume designer on The Gilded Age on HBO. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Kasia, I wanted to start by asking you, I have to imagine on a series like this, even in season two, the scale just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more grand. So what was the biggest challenge of season two that was new from season one, which I'm sure had its own you know, unique challenges? Um, you are 100% right. The scale got bigger and bigger. But I think that because we were so trained on, on season one to handle quite big challenging scenarios, the season two, um, we just stepped up the stepped up the efforts at first of all we were able to do this giant scale of the second season because we already knew and i say we that means that our design team our customers our supervisors and uh, the whole entire costume team i use the royal we but but it takes an army to execute a project like this as you can imagine and all those genius people who are most majority of them were part of the uh, season one. We knew the vocabulary of the season one. We knew the vendors, we knew the characters, the characters were developed, the worlds were developed. There was, um, we all knew each other, we knew how we were working. So it was, I think, because of that knowledge that took us so long to develop in the sec first season, we were able to step up to the bigger task. And uh, also, I think that all of us, all of the makers, all of the actors, all of the creatives, we all learned and build upon the knowledge gained in the first season. So I think that as much first season was experimental to some, to some degree, and I, I laugh that I definitely experimented, but we all learned the framework much better and i think that through the discussions with julian fellows and his feedback and there was a definitely a learning process that happened in the first season on all the levels it's this giant machine giant fascinating machine that our department is and so many layers and i think that people who are involved within the process everybody took upon themselves more responsibility because we all trusted each other that we can so because of it, it was possible to expand the, expand the volume of the, of the challenge. But for sure, the first moment when we read the script and Julian Fell starts with the opening of the Easter, I was like, oh, wow, that's like, let's go. And that immediately pro progress to this big research and discovering what it needs to be. And once we realized what it needs to be, it, 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 be, it was like building just a giant sculpture. Yeah, I wanted to ask you exactly that question, which is about that. Only the Gilded Age would start the season with this beautiful montage of, of hats and then you know dressing for Easter Sunday, just a wonderful sequence. When you see that on the page, where do you begin? Because obviously you're not only costuming your principal cast, but you have um, so many background actors to get ready for an Easter celebration at different congregations too. Um, but what's your first kind of, how do you kind of design those hats and those outfits that are so character specific and do it at such a volume all at once for one kind of grand scene? Uh, we had time to build it. We did not start filming from the Easter. We, the Easter, we had enough of time to build for that scene. But it, for me, it always starts from research. That, that the moment when I read something on the page, I immediately dive into a library of research and work our researcher by now has about 36,000 images in, uh, in our library and we studied that library over and over again. There was not much documentation of color from Easter from that period. So in a way to, tr to, to design the color palette for each, of the, for each of the scenes, I tracked down, I asked the researcher to explore the color in later period when there was color photography. And there was a speculation that happened on what happens likely, what is likely to happen in each of the worlds based on that study of color in later years. But there was plenty of information of what to do with the, with the shapes of the, of the Easter shapes from that period that comes from photography, fashion plates, paintings, anecdotal 
candy covers, uh, where there is Easter themes. There was just so much information of, we are bombarded with the information of what this Easter needs to be. And the biggest discovery, I think, was to see the masses of people going to church and ladies in those enormous hats. And that research went, again, not only in the Gilded Age, but that continued through 20s, continued through 30s, continues to today in certain areas of the country. And I thought that it would be spectacular to explore the bigness of the hats, that the hats are going to, are going to make that scene, that it's all about the colors for each of the communities, and it's about the volume of the hats. And it was once we started exploring the volume of the hats, the reality was that the research presented enormous hats, which just sometimes are a skirt to represent that bigness because it feels unreal. And definitely there was this moment of experimentation, how big can we go? And we very quickly, I realized that the hats need to be quite spectacular and quite big, and there's a place to push it. And in all of this, so first of all, as I say, we have an incredibly talented team of people who are executing this. It's, we are an army and this would never happen without that army. And each person in that army is of superpowers. I think that we have the best of the best in the country working on us. Of course, I want to say it, the best of the best in the country working on our show and the people's skills, experience, knowledge, commitment is extraordinary. And then I have this incredible support of Julian Fellows and Michael Engler and HBO who are letting me come up with this visual representation of this language that is being presented on the page. But at the same time, that support is what makes it. Like well, this would never exist without that support because we are all speaking the same language and we share this language and it's very encouraged, that language. One of the characters who has changed a lot from season one to season two is Bertha, of course. We kind of see in the end of season one, she starts to break through into the kind of old New York society, you know, having a bit of a tenuous alliance with Mrs. Astor. How does that success at the end of season one change how you dress her and costume her for season two? Does it change the colors, the, the patterns, the palette? Because um, she has some beautiful, you know, we've seen four episodes at this point when we're speaking some beautiful, you know, whites and navies and stripes and just, you know, wonderful costumes. So how does that change when the character has a kind of development like that and maybe is starting to achieve what she desired? Um, I think that to sum up Bertha is, she's building on her knowledge of the recent experiences and it's some of those parallel with my experience with the show that it's, we're building upon the knowledge of what Bertha learned, that it's, uh, she is learning the rules of the society. Nevertheless, she's expanding those roles continuously and inventing her new roles. And I keep comparing it, like it's a collection of Metropolitan Museum, it's a collection of the Whitney Museum. And it's the same people who are going to both places and understand both, but at the same time, invent, she's inventing her new language. But as Julianne Fellows pointed many times, she is, she wants to belong to that society. So we never, I never abandon her silhouette. She fits within the framework of the period. But at the same time, I created this palette for Bertha that is very different than the palette of the, of the old guard. And in her, it almost, the rebelliousness happens by using colors that the old guard is not using. So the jewel tones, we barely ever see her in, in the colors that are, belong to the old guard. The golds, the uh, maroons, navies, dark greens. I use on purpose this newness, colors of newness, whatever we associate with newness and very much play with us. And, and this time she's the owner of a house in Newport. And that's a very specific, completely different vocabulary than the city, than the city language. And uh, that I decided to spill over to her city a little bit because she's infatuated with New Newport and, and also those colors of her husband inventing the steel and the progress and the just the opening up the new worlds. I felt that it would be quite amazing to portray her in those lighter, steely, cold, bold, new colors, 
there's also something about this privilege of wearing super light colors because it means that you can, that they can be disposable. And there's so much of a history of of money and and light colors because it is the privilege of wearing white colors that they don't get if they get dirty that then they become oh, there's an army of people who will clean them or or she will have new garments and so that was definitely uh, one of the one of the trajectories of thoughts for Bertha and then at the same time this is a woman who experiments and I wanted to experiment with a lot of colors. So I shift her later on in the, in the story to quite interesting exploration of colors. And I'm fascinated by the color at the Gilded Age because it was a time when artificial dyes were invented and there is that endless amount of exploration of combinations of colors that are quite fascinating. And a lot of information comes from paintings and how the painters saw that period and how they saw the colors. And sometimes it's in house, but we also, we are not doing a documentary. We are telling a tale. And I feel that following the inspiration of painters felt like a right trajectory to explore and to be inspired by because um, they gave me the clue of how to look at that period. And I think that it was a very valuable key to the, to the understanding of how the color could be treated in that period. Yeah, it's incredible. And speaking of kind of the new, we get a really wonderful shock in, at the end of episode two with the return of Turner, um, uh -huh. who now is you know, uh, much of a much higher station than we last saw her. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about that moment. You know, it's such a reveal and it has to be shocking. So how did you pick what Turner would wear for that ball at the end of episode two? And what went into your thought process on what she would wear, you know, throughout as we really come to know her um, in her new kind of role in the series? That is, that was, that character was so fun to design because I think we all enjoy the revenge, right? And that, that storyline so much. And I felt that, and we discussed it with Michael and Julian that the Turner is uh, she fits in into the old guard. At the same time, she's a again a rule breaker, but a very intelligent rule breaker. She also worked for Bertha for all those years and understood very well the world of units and the world of European fashions. So I felt that her design should be driven by a very conservative version of the newness. So her shapes and her button up shapes and high necks and collars, her shapes are very much very conservative, but the colors still dance on the newness of Bertha. And I think that it's almost like a challenge to Bertha of showing how you do belong to the old guard. How, how do you belong to that society of that old society that Bertha was so trying to break through? And I think that loading that information to Bertha and and uh, to Turner and uh, in it, she's not supposed to be called Turner, to in it and uh, exploring that, that was really fun. And I think that it just kept emerging, emerging. And within those two rules, I always try to find something that is so specific to the actors, so specific to, to I, I, whenever we collaborate with actors, actors have this amazing energy that emanate this uh, energy of the characters. And I feel like it's my job to portray it in a visual way, if that makes any sense. That's, that's my task. So I think that uh, the collaboration with Kelly on on the, in it was just it just became this like, beautiful game of exploring those roles. Yeah, the clothing absolutely tells the story. And I also wanted to ask you about Peggy because her story this season is really interesting. Um, you know, she starts the season in mourning with her with her family, and then also has this great professional opportunity to go to Tuskegee and cover the opening of a school. I wanted to ask you about her journey and how you're telling her kind of emotional journey this season through what she's wearing. Because as I said, you know, she starts at a very, you know, tragic place, um, but she also is carrying on with her professional life. So how do you kind of explore that 
through what she wears. But I think you just named the journey. And I feel like my job is to create the, to represent the verbal into visual. And I think that that was a very specific journey. I, I have a very clear task with characters within those journeys because she's in mourning and the morning of the Gilded Age period was very specific. It was dark purples, grays combined with black. We also know that she's not revealing her full story in the society back in New York. And she, and she is not carrying that mourning throughout because it's, it's not a uh, part of her history really that is a public history. So we don't continue that mourning attire for her for too long in the story. And then we continuously present her as, as a member of this. Sorry, I got blocked. Uh, we get, uh, we portray her as a member of Black Elite. And that's a further exploration of the Black, Black Elite that we continue in the second season. And, um, keep finding pictures and descriptions and diving diving into the details, whatever we can find with the historians and researchers from up here because it's not extremely well documented. So to some degree, I definitely make a speculation based on the on the parts of history that we can explore, but I make a speculation of what Peggy as a writer, what she would wear. I did look at it uh, this as I'm watching and I was like, mm, I think she looks sometimes a bit overdressed for her occasion, but we did, you know, sometimes it's like, sometimes that happens. Like sometimes I can't hit it 100%, but at the same time, I so wanted to celebrate the black elite of the period and so wanted to give the respect for that, for that discovery because it wasn't, Pretty amazing discovery. I wasn't aware that much of the black elite of that period uh, of the phenomenon. The pictures that we found are just spectacular. And uh, and uh, I think that those, uh, the, Peggy celebrates those discoveries in, in uh, telling of the story. And I think that, that her visual portrayal is very much a tribute to, to, to the snippets of information that we were able to find of the period. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, before I let you go, Kasha, two quick questions. We're speaking about halfway through the season. Um, so first, is there anything you can tease us about where season two is heading? Obviously, some very exciting developments in episode four. Um, and also, if you can reveal or maybe hint at, do you have a favorite scene or moment or costume from all of the work you've done on season two? I know it's a tr tricky question. Tricky question, both tricky questions. I cannot reveal a thing, you know, that we are obligated by the secrecy, but it gets better and better. I can tell you that, that it's definitely, uh, as the story goes on, the joy of things happening is just a really great entertainment. I, I feel that, especially now, as we are experiencing the world, I'm proud to be part of, of work that can entertain, because I think we all need that so much. And I'm, uh, and I'm very grateful to Julian Fellows and all the creators that we managed to, that we managed to entertain people. So that's, <laughs> that's what's coming up. And then, uh, uh, I don't have favorites. It's, I think that, Every costume, I think that we have a full-blown democracy in, in our approach. And I think that it's the attention paid to every single character that shows up on the screen. I think that I can, um, I can attest to that, to that endless amount of attention paid to each character. And that goes for the principles and the backgrounds. Like our team that is dealing with backgrounds is just beyond phenomenal. It's it's just phenomenal. I just see. I just wish we saw more of the backgrounds because the details, the the characters, the artistry that was put into the backgrounds is astonishing. And it's led on the enormously talented team. And 
I would hesitate not to mention all the names because well, I would have to mention all the names because each person is so incredibly important in this process. It is an incredibly overwhelming amount of work and it just it does leap across the screen. Um, Kasha Valika Momon, congratulations on season two of the Gilded Age. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby. Thank you very much, David.